All righty. Let me share my screen so everybody can see it real quick. Maybe. All right, so welcome everybody. We are so excited to have you for today. Um, I hope you are going to have a great time and get a lot of information out of today's session. There's a couple resources before we get started. We have a Padlet for you to ask your questions since in the live stream, you will not have the ability to have a chat feature. So if you wanna add any comments or questions, feel free. Um, on here we have leave your questions and comments and feel free to add anything. Also feel free to answer any questions that you might be able to. So this is the Padlet. Down at the bottom there are some resources for you. We have collaborative notes and then we also have a Wakelet. So the Wakelet is going to be a recess for, re, resource for you after the session. On the collaborative notes feel free to join the notes and take notes as you're listening. And again, everything's hyperlinked here if you need another spot. And then after the session, we are going to add the recording and all the notes and any links that were mentioned onto this Wakelet. So if anybody would like to see the Wakelet, that is gonna be also available. All right, Brian, I'm gonna kick it to you. So good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for joining us today as we talk about how to promote technology with distance learning. First of all, I just want to say thank you to all the teachers that are joining us. Uh, you've all done a fantastic job in the quick transition uh, from traditional school to remote learning. So the question that's now in front of all of us is, what will school and what will education look like next year? Uh, we do know that technology is going to be a big part of that answer. So today it's our honor to connect you uh, with Jamie Cassup from Google. I also want to say thank you to Stephanie Howe and our instructional technology coordinators for uh, connecting all of us together today. So Jamie Cassup is the educational evangelist at Google. Jamie evangelizes power and the potential of technology and the web as enabling and supporting tools in the pursuit of promoting inquiry-driven learning models. Jamie collaborates with school systems, educational organizations, <laughs> leaders focused on building innovation, iteration, and our school and our educational policies and practices. He practice speeches. <clears throat> he speaks on education, technology, innovation, and Generation Z at events all around the world. And Jamie joined us in Pickerington in 2017 as we hosted one of the Google Leadership events. So Jamie, thank you so much for joining us and it's all yours. Thank you very much for happy, having me. So uh, I, I, when I joined the call, I said, happy Thursday. So that's what I say to everyone. Happy Thursday because every day is Thursday. And in a world where every day is Thursday, you know, it's like the end of the week and the weekend's coming. It's just Thursday is just the perfect day. So I just say happy Thursday. You know that we are in an, in an interesting time when today here, I, I'm broadcasting from my studio here in Phoenix, Arizona. And today, uh, Luke Air Force Base, which was one of the major uh, bases in the country, happens to be here in Arizona where they fly F-16s and F-35s from. Um, they are having a flyover to, to celebrate all the healthcare workers. And so they're flying through the city uh, doing a loop, like 16 of these planes. And if you ever hear a jet fighter, you know how loud they are. Can you imagine 16 of them flying low through the valley? And I've known about this for about a week. And this is the most exciting thing <laughs> that's ever happened in my life because you're stuck at home. And I've been looking forward to this all week. So that's happening today. So that's the world that we live in now where I have to be excited about a plane flying over my head. Anyway, um, welcome to my studio in, in Phoenix, Arizona. Let me give you a quick background of who I am, if you don't know who I am. And then I want to talk a little bit about kind of what I'm seeing out there. And, and I've had an interesting perspective and angle on all this. So uh, I am the education evangelist at Google. That's one of the roles that I serve in life. I've been at Google now for 14 years. Uh, I launched uh, Google Apps for Education that we now call G Suite, and I still can't get used to saying G Suite. Uh, launched Google Apps back in 2006 here in Arizona at Arizona State University. Uh, worked with a bunch of universities. A couple years later, launched, uh, launched uh, what do you call this, uh, Google Apps for Education into the K-12 space. Worked with the state of Oregon, was the first state to use these tools in their school system, and then 
a couple years after that, had a really crazy idea and launched Chromebooks into education, into the education space. And so my job at Google over the past 12 years has been to work with the different teams that are doing things in the education environment, right? To be a thought partner, to be a subject matter expert, to bring back feedback. Because one of the things that I've been able to do is travel around the world, uh, speaking at events and, and working with institutions and, and higher education institutions and getting a sense of what the issues are, getting a sense of what the concerns are, what the topics are, what the questions are, and being able to capture all that and then bring that back into Google, into other places as well. So I've been able to do that. Now, obviously I haven't gone anywhere in the last couple of months, but I still have been traveling around the world because if you watch my YouTube channel a couple of weeks ago, I asked, and this is how we're talking here today. I asked uh, teachers and professors, if you want me to come into your classroom while you're having these virtual classrooms, I'd be happy to come in and talk to students. And this is how this happened. And you know, the unintended consequence of that it has been that I thought maybe 10 people would reach out, but my calendar is booked from like six in the morning till three in the afternoon. Now it's booked like through the end of the school year. It's just, it's crazy. But the unintended consequence of this, when I thought only 10 people would reach out, I've had lots and lots and lots of these types of conversations. And I've had them all over the world. I've, I'm, uh, on Monday at 11.30 at night talking to professors at a university in Ethiopia, right? And so for me, one of the, the takeaways from all this is to understand what the questions are and the topics and the concerns. So I wanna make sure I leave plenty of time here, maybe even more than the 10 minutes to schedule to answer questions that you guys might have so I can understand what some of the concerns are. So I also started a school here in Phoenix called the Phoenix Coding Academy. And this is a school that's focused on computer science as a language that students are, are learning across the board. Uh, that We planned this seven years ago. We're four years in. This is not a charter school. It's not a private school. It's an actual just regular old K-12 high school uh, that's here in part of the Phoenix Union School District. Uh, I was going to be the commencement speaker for our first graduation class, but instead we have to do things differently. So I'm going to be shooting a video for them. Um, but really excited and proud of the work that we've done at the Phoenix Coding Academy. And you can look up more information about what we're doing there. And I'm hoping that we capture more of the learnings that we've gone through for the first cycle of students that have gone through the Phoenix Coding Academy. Uh, as mentioned, I work with a bunch of institutions and I do all those things, but all this is part of my passion for education because I'm one of the students that often need the support the most from our educators, right? I'm a first generation American, born and raised in Hell's Kitchen, New York. I grew up on welfare and food stamps with a single mother. And the problem that I'm trying to solve is that one, it's, it's a hypothesis, right? It's this idea that either I have one or two options. Either I've been successful and I've been able to do what I've been able to accomplish in my life because I have a 500 IQ and I'm some kind of super genius and, and that's what my wife thinks, I think. Or there are millions and millions and millions of students who are just like me who don't have an opportunity or don't have the access or don't have the, the luck that they need uh, to thrive in their worlds. And what I'm trying to do is eliminate luck as the sole requirement uh, for success for students who are growing up like I did, right? So that's what I focus on. So all the work that I do is around that. And, and that problem can be solved in the K-12 space, in the higher education space, in the business space, in the professional development space, all over the place. So that's that's kind of what I do. So, so that's who I am. That's the kind of work that I do. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the what happened, like where we are today and kind of my perception of where where we where we are and where we're going. So what's interesting is that at the beginning of all this, when we thought this was going to be for a couple of weeks and temporary, uh, what I noticed was what we were trying to do in education is take that model of the classroom, right, which was a, let's say, a teacher in a classroom with 30 students. And we were trying to take that and replicate it online. 
right? Trying to do the same thing online. And I think because we've been doing this for, for, for a while now, what we recognize, what we realize is that that's not possible, that we can't just replicate the same model online, that we need to change what we look at in terms of education and what it looks like because of the situation that we're in. So we can no longer just replicate the online experience. You can't take a teacher with 30 students and then, then put that online and have the same teacher work with 30 students because you, the pacing isn't there, the timing isn't there. When you are in a classroom and I taught 10th, I taught communication skills at the Phoenix Coding Academy before, the, the, it's a lot different being in the middle of a room where you can point and see and feel. I mean, you can feel the culture of a room. You can feel the attitude. You can you can walk into a class. A teacher can walk into a classroom. It's like, why is everybody down without anybody saying a word? You can feel that. These are things that you don't pick up online as well. And so thinking that we can do exactly the same thing doesn't make any sense. And I think that's the, the transitional stage that we're in now to figure out what should it look like. So that's part one. The second part on the parent side is that I saw a lot of parents uh, freak out because now all of a sudden a lot of them had to work from home or in worst case, they, they couldn't stay home. They had to still go to work and now they had a kid at home, right? So uh, I saw them, even if you could work from home, freaking out about how to do this because, you know, a parent's education experience is that, you know, they were in third grade once. They don't have that experience to do that. And all of a sudden we were asking them, oh, oh, parent, you are now the teacher, right? And and so they they lost their, they lost it because of that. And they want all their students back in school. So we had this dynamic happen. And I, I on my YouTube channel, I posted a, a video for parents about like, chill out, um, here's my advice, work on basic things. The teachers are gonna help you along with the process, but focus on the things that are central. So out of those two conditions, there's a couple of things that have come out for me. Number one is it gives us an opportunity to think about the skills that our students need, right? And I often talk about this in my, in my presentations, it's the skills that we've all talked about for a very long time, right? We talk about students needing problem solving skills, uh, collaboration skills, the, the ability to learn, critical thinking and creativity. I have a five-year-old and well, I have a, I have a 27 year old, a 19 year old and a five-year-old. And yeah, some of you are like right now are like yelling at your computer screens because you realize that I have, I tried to have one child at a time, right? I thought that would be easy. Like I, I can have three kids, but one at a time. And what's happened now is that it's all backfired on me because now I have three generations of kids in the house at the same time and they are all driving me insane. But that's a personal problem. Anyway, when I think about my five-year-old, no matter what the content is, no matter what the subject is, those are the things that I want her to be able to know how to do. Those are the skills that I want her to focus on. And so when we think about our students, we've looked at that list for a very long time, right? We call them 21st century skills. We're 20 years into the 21st century and we're still talking about 21st century skills. But we've also, even I'm guilty of this, have looked at this list as all these skills are important, right? Like so much so that a trigger, you want to trigger me, call them soft skills. Because I, I believe for a long time that they're essential, they're critical skills that our students need given the future that we face. And, and so when you look at that list, it looks like, yeah, they should do all these things at the same time. But one of the things that's come up for me is this idea that maybe we could prioritize these skills. And what I mean by that is I look at that list and then I think about the situation that we're in and one of those skills jumps off the page for me. And that is the ability to learn. So I want to highlight that, that for a second. Because I don't mean the ability to take tests or to outline a textbook or to take notes. That's not what I mean. I'm talking about the ability to learn in a world where you're driving your own learning, right? The ability to learn starts with self-awareness. I don't know how to do something. Where can I learn how to do it? Right? That The ability to say... I don't know how to do something. Where can I learn how to do it? And then, and then how do I know I'm doing it well? How do I assess myself through this? Or how do I ask others to help assess me, right? This idea of you only grow if you're doing those three things, finding the, the education that you need, 
making sure the education that you're getting is good and then assessing that education that you're getting, right? That's how you get better at what you do. And it starts with this self-awareness where I don't know how to do something. And what's important about that is in our culture and society, we, we, we try to pretend like we don't, like we know everything or there's a stigma against not knowing something. So nobody ever raises their hand. This is, these are issues that we've been dealing with in a long, for a long time. Even in the business world, the, there's, a, there's a mantra of, you know, fake it till you make it. And I, that, you know, that's another trigger word, fake it till you make it. That, that's insane to me, right? This idea that you're just gonna fake it. Like you're a pilot, you, oh, I wanna fly airplanes. I'm gonna get on the airplane. I'm just gonna take off. I'm gonna fake it till I make it. You just, it doesn't work, right? So fake it till you make it doesn't work. What does work is, oh, there's something in front of me. I don't know about it or I don't know how to do it. I, now I have to learn how to do it. And it's a mind shift. It's, it's changing the conversation. When I talk to adults, and this has happened for years, when I to talk to adults, they'll say to me, hey, you're very creative. Um, I wish I was creative. I'm not a very creative person. Or I'll s talk to an adult who say, oh, I'm terrible at financing. I just, I don't understand financing. I'm bad at it. Or when we talk to students, um, oh, I'm bad at math. I've just always been bad at math. I'm bad at math. Those are things, these seem like these standards that we have. And in reality, when I respond back to these students or when I respond back to these adults, I'll say, no, you've chosen not to be creative. You've chosen not to be good at finance and you've chosen not to be good at math. Everything that you need to learn is there for you, whether it is in school, whether it's online, wh wherever it is, it's out there. It's a choice that you're making not to be creative. That there are lots of tools that you can use to learn how to be creative. There's lots of things that you can do to practice if you're being creative. And then there are lots of tools or ways to tell whether you're being creative or not, right? There's the, all the things that you need are out there. And so it starts with the self-awareness where an adult or a student will say, Oh, you know what? I'm 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 ter I'm not very creative. I, I need to learn how to be, be I need to learn how to be more creative. Or, you know, I'm not very good with financing. I what's my plan to get better at financing? What are the things that I need to learn? Where 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 are that where is that information? Right. So it's a mind shift to look at learning in a different way. And I think given the future and where we're going with digitalization and the fact that digitalization is going to be part of everything and our students need better human skills. And now this situation where students have to learn on their own to a large, large degree, this idea of building skills where our students can be able to learn whatever they want is absolutely critical. But it's that mind shift. It's this idea that it's, it's not a question of whether I can learn something, it's a question of time, right? Time is irrelevant when it comes to learning. And what I mean by that is, you, it might take you, if both of us start with not knowing anything about fractions, it might take you 10 minutes to figure out fractions. It might take me 10 years to learn how to do fractions, but the idea of learning is there. The idea that you can constantly learn is there. It's just the time is irrelevant. And we, we set up those barriers of time. You need to know X by this date is something that we created. When in reality, it might take you 10 years to be creative. And, and that's fine. But the, the concept is that the ability to learn is there, right? You can, you can learn all day for 16 hours, go to bed, and the next morning, your brain is empty again, and you can do it all over again, right? That, that kind of mindset, that ability, the ability to learn is critical. When I launched my YouTube channel uh, last year, I knew zero about videography. Like, literally nothing. Like, I maybe recorded video on on my phone every once in a while and never posted it anywhere because I didn't even know how to edit that short clip that I shot on my phone. And that was easy to do. I'm a photographer. I've always had good cameras, but I'm, I didn't even know my camera had a record button on it. Uh, my daughter, my 27 year old, who is actually an editor, she has a degree in film. She has a degree in film production, works in film production, works in editing. She actually lives and works in New York. She works for CNN. She makes fake news and she is an expert in this space. So I went to an expert. My idea is like, okay, I got to start my YouTube channel. I don't know how to do this. Where do I start? Well, I go to my daughter. 
and I say, I don't know anything about this. Where do I start? And she said, okay, start here. Shoot at 24 frames per second, double your shutter speed, keep your ISO at 100 because you don't want your film to get grainy. You don't need to shoot in 4K, shoot in 1080. And if you go outside and you want to shoot outside, you're going to need an ND filter, but you should probably get a variable ND filter because your aperture is going to be wide open and a lot of light's going to get in and it's going to blow you out. So you want to be able to control the light. That's where she said, start there. And I said, cool, thanks. Thank you for all that information. Okay, here's my second question. What the hell do any of those words mean? Zero knowledge of this stuff. And a year later, I can have debates about whether 8-bit in-camera recording is better than 10-bit and what a 12-bit external recorder would do to film. I can edit in Premiere Pro. I can edit in Final Cut. I can edit on my phone all within a year, and I'm only going to get better at this. I And you look at my YouTube videos, and this is the assessment part. If I watch my YouTube videos, the first couple of videos look like hostage videos, and now they're getting better. Can I do better? Absolutely. But that mindset of the ability to learn. So I believe that the most important thing that we can focus on between now and whenever normal comes back is helping our students develop that mindset, helping them develop this idea of the ability to learn, right? So, so that's number one. The second thing, and I want to make sure I leave time. I got time. So the second thing I want to I want to make sure I highlight in terms of skills that we often don't talk about is digital skills, and it's tied to the first thing. And we've given this generation a pass. We're guilty. Everyone here is guilty of doing that. We call them digital natives. We tell them that they were born with technology, therefore they just naturally know how to use technology, right? Like, oh, I, I got to set up my, my new DVD player. Where's the eight-year-old? He was just gifted and born with this technology. He knows how to use it. And the evidence suggests that, they're, that that's not true. I mean, this is evidence. This is an opinion. Stanford study from a couple of years ago showed us that 82% of elementary school kids can't tell you the difference between a sponsored website and a real news site. 80% of high school kids couldn't pull out the fake story when, when presented five stories. They're not good at this. We've never taught them how to be good at this. And this idea that just because they're born and there's technology, they just naturally know how to use it might be the most insane assumption we've ever made. It would be the same assumption as if, you know, all of us were brought home from the hospital in a car and, you know, you grew up in the back seat of the car and you faced the front seat and then you sat in the front seat of the car and then eventually you got old enough where you could, you know, potentially drive the car. And did anyone's parents say, look, when you were born, there were just cars around. You grew up with cars. Here's a car. No, you were taught how to use a car. You were taught the rules of the road. And then you were taught like the California rules of the road or the Texas rules of the road. You were taught how to be a defensive driver, how to be an offensive driver. You were taught all these different things, and then you were tested on whether or not you knew those things. And then, even after all that, you were told, okay, you can drive, but only in the day. Okay, you can drive at night now, but you, can only, you can't drive on the highway. Okay, you can drive on the highway, but you can't go on long road trips. Like, we went through these stages of learning when it came to taking this giant technology and using it. But for some reason, I, I can make an argument that this technology is more dangerous than that car. And for some reason, we don't, we never taught our kids how to use it. So I think the other thing that I hope comes out of this is this understanding that this generation doesn't know how to use these tools. And if we really want them to be learners, if we want them to know how to learn and to be able to look for information and vet information and make sense of information and know where to find information, we have to teach them digital skills. Like we have to dive deeper into this so that we have a digital skill curriculum, a program where they're learning these things because then we can let them loose a little bit, right? We can give them a little more freedom in terms of the ability to learn, right? So those are the things that I, I think have pulled out of what we're going through. And they're all basic part of these five skills, right? Because really, when I talk about digital skills, I'm really talking about critical thinking, right? The, the idea that you can look at a piece 
of news and determine through critical thinking whether it's factual, where the sources are, vet it, where does it belong, how do I use it, right? Critical thinking skills. So those skills, because at the end of the day, those skills, those five things that I want my five-year-old to know how to do is what's going to separate us from the machines because the machines are coming, whether we like it or not, right? We are at the beginning of digitalization. And by digitalization, I mean artificial intelligence, machine learning, AR, VR, automation, robotics, that whole package. We are at the very, 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 very beginning of this. And I'll, and I'll give you an example how much at the beginning we are. Google had a breakthrough uh, a couple of months ago in quantum computing. And I'm not going to get into defining quantum computing, but it, it, it's enough to know that it's a, an unbelievable way to think about computing in a, in a three dimension. Think about like, you know, programming in 3D, right? That's probably the best way to think about it. Now, here's the breakthrough, the example of the breakthrough. If you took the, if you took a mathematical equation, one of the most complex ones, and fed it to the world's most powerful supercomputer it would take that supercomputer 10,000 years to process the equation, right? We mathematicians have those things that take a million years, right? So it would take 10,000 years to go through that equation. This breakthrough that we had in quantum computing, it took 300 seconds. Now, that wasn't done on a MacBook Pro or a Chromebook. That was, you know, the giant rooms of servers and all this information to get to quantum computing. But one day you will be on a MacBook Pro or a Chromebook. And so we have to ask ourselves 10,000 years to 300 seconds. What's possible in that world that we're headed into? And when you look at it that way, then human skills, problem solving, critical thinking, the ability to learn, creativity, these become essential to work well with what we're doing with digitalization, right? Because we were at the very beginning of this, those skills are critical. And that's, that's important to think about because we have to take a step back and look at how we do education today and realize that if we're focused on standardized tests, if we're focused on whether a kid gets a certain score in a test, and we actually really think about it and realize that the, a basic machine learning algorithm can do better on a standardized test than a human can, why are we teaching our kids, our students, things that a machine is going to do better already when we should be focused on these other things? So I hope the other thing that comes out of this is an understanding of what's essential, what's critical, what are the things that we really want to do? And so I think that to me is the opportunity that we have in front of us, right? Because the model that I started with, which was taking the classroom and rep trying to replicate it online doesn't work because it can't work. If all we take is technology and try to do the same model, if all we do is lay it on top of our current model, then the best that we can do is maybe get faster results. What we need to do, this is an opportunity for us to think about the best ideas that we have in learning. And not even opinion ideas. I'm talking about research, uh, the best research that you've seen, the best research that we know about student-driven, about how collaboration works within students, like all the best research that we have of what learning is, and then ask ourselves, how do we use these tools? How do we eliminate all the stuff that's not essential? And how do we use the tools that we have in front of us to bring these ideas to life? And that's what I'm hoping the next opportunity is to have those discussions to figure out what we can do moving forward. Totally understand that we have to react to the world that we're in now, but we have to learn how to do both at the same time. React to the world that we're in now, deal with that, but at the same time, making sure that we have enough time and space to think about what we can do with this opportunity for the future. And regarding, and this will be the last thing I'll say, and I'll be happy to answer questions that you guys might have. We can spend the rest of the time doing that. The last thing I'll say is that there are a number of great tools out there that I'm sure you guys are aware of, and there's lots of teachers and educators that are out there. If you know of great tools that are out there, share them across Twitter, tag me in a picture or tag me in those, in those tweets. My, my daughter and I created my board 
<laughs> uh, tag me on, on Twitter. I'd be happy to pass that out through my network. This is a great time for us to share all the resources that we have to get us through all this. If you go to the Google for Education homepage, you'll find a bunch of research, a bunch of resources there for educators. Um, the team has been heads down, either finding resources, creating resources. The engineering teams are head down, building features into the products at a speed. I've been at Google for 14 years, and I have never seen the speed at which engineers are building things. And this, so this is a great opportunity to give them feedback by going into, for example, the feedback button on Google Classroom and saying, I wish Classroom did this, or this was my experience, or you know, they, they take all that feedback and there's a whole functioning uh, COVID team out there that is building all these tools. And a lot, I know lots of organizations are doing that. But for some of us in a team, while they do that, my job is to think about kind of what's next and what we can do with this. And again, this is all personal for me. I base everything that I'm talking to you about uh, based on my five-year-old and those skills that I want her to be able to know how to do. And how do I let her drive that learning? Because the subject doesn't matter. It's the skills that she's developing. So for uh, in the YouTube video that I, I made for parents, I challenge parents to see how long they could take to answer a question. Right. And what I mean by that is I use the example in, in the video, like when my five-year-old says, Hey, she's in the bathtub and she goes, Hey, where does water go? Now I, as a, either an educator or as a parent can look at a list and say, uh, no, I'm sorry. Here it says that we should be studying about space or we should be studying about geography. And so this is what we should be learning. So forget that question. Let's look at the, let's, let's come up with questions about these topics. No, I want to use that question to drive these skills. I can, I think I'm skilled enough where I can take eight hours to answer that question. Oh, where does water go when you pull the tub or when you pull the cord on a, in a bathtub? Well, what is water? What's the chemical makeup of water? Where does water come from? How, what's evaporation? What's precipitation? What do all clouds have water in them? Which ones rain? Why do they rain? Where, where, which way does rain flow? Why are some drops bigger than others? How does that happen? How come more, how come some clouds have lots of heavy water and some clouds only have light water? What causes that? Where does water fall? What's a reservoir? What's a dam? We have a giant dam. I can drive her to the dam. That's the Hoover Dam an hour from here, and she can see the dam. What's the dam? Where does the dam come from? How did we know we wanted to create dam? What's the, what's the water flow? What, what's the river? We have here in, in Arizona, for example, in Phoenix, our whole water system is based on what the Hohokam Indians built 1,500 years ago. Who were the Hohokam Indians? How do they know that? How do they build these waterways? What do they do in the treatment plan? What happens with water? Where do, is water in the toilet the same as water from the sink? Eight hours to answer where does water go, right? And so how do we, and, and think about all, this, all the things that I can teach her through critical thinking and problem solving and, and creativity around that just one question. And by the way, I bet you I can still also teach her about space or I can also teach her about geography using water because that's what she's curious about. So it's an opportunity for us to have students drive some of their learning because of the things that they're curious or passionate about if they have the ability to learn and they have the digital skills to look for information, to find information, to be able to process information, to be able to know where all that information is because those are the things that they need to know given the future that we face. So I will pause there and answer any questions that you guys might have. All right, so we've got a Padlet full of questions, so I hope you're ready. The first question, um, I guess, is more of a suggestion. What do you suggest for students with learning disabilities? Is there anything that you think is a must? Yeah, and, and I'm not an expert in any way on learning disabilities, and I know there's a, a wide scale of what we call learning disabilities. Um, I, I think for me, you know, I, 
whatever kind of situation, for example, my child is in, I, I, I create whatever custom education is for that child, right? So this idea that we can customize education. The, the point is that we can't take uh, the same, like the same test and give them to all students and expect them all to be the same. Because the other thing that we didn't get the chance to talk about, and I'd be happy to talk about here is this idea of inequity in education, right? Those of us who have fought inequity in education, who have fought for these issues, we've known that these issues have been there the whole time. Everyone knows that these issues are here. But what we can clearly see now is that these inequities have really been highlighted, right? Whether it's access to quality education if you have a learning disability or whether you don't have internet access at home or whether you don't have access through a machine that you can utilize, right? There's a huge difference in the gap that we have between those that have things and, and, the, and, the, and the information that they need and those and, and the resources that they need and those that don't. And I'm hoping that's the other thing that goes through this is like, whoa, we got these huge gaps in inequity that we need to solve and learning disability and resources for learning disability to me is one of those. And, and we can't just pretend that all kids are the same anymore. Thank you for that. The next question, this one might be a fun one. So what are some things that teachers can do with their students through Google Meets to make it kind of fun other than just talking? So this could be online games or maybe something with technology. Yeah, okay, so I'll share a personal story with you. I, we have fr dear friends, we hang out with them all the time. They, they live about 15 minutes from here. We haven't seen them in two months. And we kind of missed each other. And so Amanda is, is the woman's name. She's like, let's play um, one of those online games. And I'm like, no, not, I'm just, that's stupid. I'm not doing that. There's just no way I'm doing that. And, and they forced me through peer pressure, all three of them, my wife and those two, forced me to do this, completely did not want to do this. And I'm the one who had the most fun, right? I'm the one who was like, oh, let's do this again. Right? And now we have weekly scheduled game night meetings because I had no idea. So I think the number one advice is just to try stuff, right? Just to see what sticks, see what happens. And and everything from uh, guess my background, right? Or, or you know, creating different kinds of backgrounds. I don't know if you can do that in me, other apps you can do that in, but, you know, or uh, highlighting things. One of the cool things about the space that we're in now is that I, you know, I get to stand on stages uh, all over uh, the world and I never get to do this. Check out my cell phone. Right, <laughs> this is my phone, so I can I can be this, and so I can take this and be like, how does this work? Where does this come from? When when was this around? So I can have a contest with my students if they have access to the internet. Like, what is this? Anyone recognize this? What does it do? And t let's find the history. Now all of a sudden, I can dive into the history of cell phones, right? But this is an actual working phone. So the fact that we have access to things that we can put in front of the camera and talk about those things is kind of cool. And I don't see a lot of educators or even parents doing some of that where we can take our stuff and, and almost do like grown up or student show and tells where we can take these objects uh, and dive deeper into these things. The next question is more of a personal question. What is the coolest, most useful thing you have learned since COVID started? <laughs> Okay, so a couple, couple of things about that. I got to pre preface some of this. I am living with unbelievable guilt. And the reason why is because I, I know this is hard for some people to believe, but I am a dysfunctional introvert. Like I am an introvert extreme. Like I should be on medication. That's how bad of an introvert I am. Now, if you come to me and say like two months ago and say, listen, um, you have to stay in your studio <laughs> Uh, you can't go anywhere. No one can come visit you. You can't go out or be social or visit anyone. And you can't travel anywhere for the time being. I would be like, are you, are you punking me? Like, like, is this, is this real? Like why, what if I died and go to gone to heaven? Like I've been in heaven because of that personally. Now, even I, who am an extreme introvert, I'm, I'm to the point where like, oh no, okay, now I need to go outside. That's why I'm going up on my roof to look at airplanes because I'm starting to go a little stir crazy, just like everyone else. But for me, what I've learned through this process is that I can dive deep into 
things that I've wanted to do. Here's the big lesson for me. All of us have this masterful to-do list, right? So for me, if you watch one of my videos, I, I use post-it notes. So all those post-it notes that you might be able to see in the background there, those are all my to-do items. The green are work. The orange is uh, like personal things like take the car in for service, or, you know, things like that. And then the yellow are things that I want to learn. And if you look here, you can see the green is really filled out. The orange is really filled out because I can't go anywhere, right? I can't go buy something at Home Depot if that's on the list. But the yellow, the yellow only has like five post-it notes on it. And the reason why is because the yellow had 40 post-it notes on it because it was everything from learn lighting, learn how to do the adjustment brush in Lightroom, uh, learn how to do this or learn like all these learning things. And so for me, what I've been able to do is go through those post-it notes, those learning ones. And so I think I've learned lots of things about photography. I've learned lots of things about videography. I've learned lots of things about different topics like printers. Like I'm at the point now where I want to get a printer to print my own prints as opposed to sending them in. So I've taken this opportunity to learn about the things that I'm passionate about in my personal life. And I've kind of ignored some of the work stuff. And a lot of it has to do because I'm doing a lot of these calls and so I don't have a lot of free time. But I think that to me is the most important thing that we can do now is what's on that to-do list? What is it that we want? Like you're not gonna have another opportunity like this where you can dive deep into learning something because you're forced to be in one place. Um, so we, the next question is a teacher who's new to Google Classroom and she's mm -hmm. a high school math teacher and she's struggling out, struggling with ways to figure out the best way to insert math into Google Forms. Do you have any ideas or suggestions or any way that I, I, I don't. But I, so, so a couple of things. One is send me that question on Twitter and I will, and I think this is what we can all do, right? Is back to this idea of being okay with not knowing, right? Being comfortable with not knowing something, right? And saying, and, and tweeting out something like, Hey, I, I'm not very good or I'm learning how to use, you know, math in in google forms anyone have any great suggestions if you tweet that out you yourself and then copy people like me who have a good chunk of followers then we can retweet that out i guarantee you that five minutes later you'll have five things to do with matt and that's the thing about learning is that we we all are on the same page which is like there's stuff that you know and there's stuff that i know and there's stuff that we don't know and that together we can learn things you'll start getting reactions so so definitely do that. And the one thing about math, I'm going to share this real quickly because I was talking to a, a class of students this morning. And one of the things about math and, and is that I told these students that math, you know, like kids say, I'm not good at math. When do I need to know math? And, and so what I, uh, I said to these students is that math is like being in the matrix. Like math is in everything. There is nothing that your eyeballs can look at that doesn't involve math. Everything has math. This light has math. This camera has math. This microphone has math. The, the plant that I'm looking at out there has math. You can do a mathematical formula of how that plant grows depending on measuring sunlight and measuring growth and measuring water levels. Like everything has math. And if you understand math, you are inside the matrix. So I, one of the things that I hope we do on the education side is figure out how to do math inside everyday objects and everyday things that our students use. I love that. So yeah, definitely reach out to other colleagues and ask them for help too. The next question, I don't know if you have any insight or okay. any information that Google might has not, has not communicated out, but will they ever give the option to record right in Google Slides? I'm my experience in the 14 years of doing this is that when someone says, I wish the, this Google tool would do X, there's a good chance that that's on a roadmap. And the reason why it hasn't is because there's other things in front of it, or there's some technology issue with it. Right? So I would tell, I would say what you should do is the first question I always ask teachers when they ask me things like that is, did you give that feedback into the feedback button? Uh, you know, a lot of times we think about those feedback buttons or uh, as they, you know, they're a black hole that go in the middle. Nobody ever reads those. But in our case, you know, there's a there's a real person that goes through that feedback every day, takes those comments, aggregates them, puts them in a spreadsheet. And now all of a sudden engineers are looking at, oh, this question or this request is up here. 
and these are down here, which one should we do first, right? So it's important to be able to provide that feedback and, and, and whether that is through you know, the feedback button or sending something out on Twitter or you know the message button in the, in the form that you know, for the Google for Education website, wherever it is, throwing that feedback out there is critical because how are the engineers gonna build things if they don't know what it is that you guys want them to build? Yeah, definitely provide feedback. I know Google has made huge updates to meet with all the feedback that different teachers have provided. So they are listening to you, I promise. Um, the final question, unless somebody asked another question on the Padlet before we end this question, is what are some new ways and technology programs that we should think about to help parents and how do we not overwhelm families? Yeah, that's a great question because there's been a bunch of articles uh, that um, that talk about parent fatigue and you know learning at home and there's these like counter you know counter culture articles like you know screw education my kids watching videos all day right like just a lot of that I tweeted out a couple of days ago uh, uh, there was a New York Times article where parents want their kids to go back to school and I said something like the next time teachers you know say something like we need, you know, uh, we like we need to raise funds for, or we need salary increases for. Like before, you can even fin the set, finish the sentence. Parents would be like, "Yeah, whatever, whatever you want, just take it, please, just take it, right?" Uh, because that's another thing that I think has come out of this is hopefully an appreciation for what teachers do. And and I know lots of parents have always appreciated appreciated teachers, but nothing gives you appreciation more than trying to do what the person does, right? Like. I can appreciate uh, a, a, a maintenance person working in an ER, right? Like I can appreciate that work, but until I do 12 hours of ER maintenance work or cleanup work, I'm never gonna appreciate it the way I could doing it that way. And I think some of that experience for our, our parents is happening. I think one of the things that we can do for our parents is again, break, the, break down the necessity, break down the things that are are absolutely critical. And so one of the things that I said to, to the parents that seem to have resonated a lot with them is to focus on the basics. Because if you think about kind of like our students need to know X before Y, in other words, this date, right? I, I, oh, oh, our students are falling falling behind. Falling behind what? what what's, the, what's the artificial timeline that we put out there? Falling behind what, really, if you think about it? or our students need to close out this subject be before this date. Why, right? So I think we need, we all need to take a step back and think about that. And if you do it that way, then all of a sudden we can, for we can spend more time focused on the basics. So for example, the, some of the advice that I give in parents, some of the advice that I give in parents is just like if your kid just reads, right? And if they read books, not that you tell them to read, but that they want to read, that is so much further along than trying to force them to learn something that they might not be interested in, right? So this idea of like, if you can just get your kid to read. So for example, if I'm working from a home and I have a 12 year old, I can have that 12 year old on the couch, reading a book, reading Harry Potter, reading whatever, right? That is huge and not feeling guilty about that, not saying they're, that your students are behind because they're not at some artificial level that we created, just reading. Think about what the what you can learn from just reading, right? And so that's one angle, writing. Let's say your kid wants to write, have your kid write and be able to provide them feedback on their writing. You might not be very good at fractions, but you're probably pretty good at reading things and being able to provide feedback, right? So basics, basic reading, basic writing, and then letting them drive curiosity and helping them ask the right questions through that curiosity. But if you can do that basic stuff. And then for me, as far as I'm concerned, the early, you know, if you're talking about like third grade and earlier, the play, right? Just play. Just I like I've been I've I've watched my five-year-old go from, hey, I need you to play with me because I don't know how to play by myself. Or she's used to between 5 p.m. and you know, she's used to being in school all day. And then she comes home. And then between this hour and this hour, we play together. So that was her, that was her experience with playing was with me. 
we've had to kind of retrain her on how to play by herself. And so now she's doing that a lot more. So just the idea of using your imagination and being creative and just playing and let them drive that is helpful. And then for older grades, one of the things that I've been saying to parents is if your kid is struggling on a subject, let's say they are struggling with math, this is a great opportunity to go as far back as you need to, to where they remember things or where they were good at things. Even if it's two plus two, go back to that and using the tools like Khan Academy and other things that are out there, ST Math, for example, whatever you need to use, and ST Math is free, by the way, for parents right now, um, go back there and then have your, your student teach you, right? Is there a better way to learn than to teach? So have your student take a step back and teach you from where they know until you guys run into struggles and then you can work together on something, right? So there's these creative ideas that you can use for parents to give them more control over the learning as opposed to giving them a bunch of curriculum that say your kid needs to know this stuff by June 1st, right? And that's just going to drive them insane. So let's think about what artificial lines, back to the idea of what's necessity and what isn't, and then what are basic things that are that we know our parents can handle that help students grow, but maybe not in the way we have planned it for them coming up. Um, the next question is, what Chrome extension do you recommend? Oh, OK. So uh, you're going to like this one. There's, there's a Chrome extension called Tucon, right, like the animal. and and I've been working with these guys because I think this is really cool. And, and I'm trying to get them to build some other stuff. But Tucon is an extension that you can you can get. And it's mostly all, most of it is free. They have some premium stuff, but it's a lot of it is free for language right now, right? Which is you can take th these packets and sign up for them. And now when you are doing your normal browsing, when you are reading, when you are going through your things, I was trying to find an example what you will get is words that show up that are highlighted, but they're in Spanish. And so you're reading and then all of a sudden a word will show up in Spanish and, and you through context know what that word is. And so you're learning a language, um, in this case, Spanish. And I think there's like four or five different languages that you can learn. And it's been, as someone who speaks Spanish, it's been very helpful. I was trying to find, you know, just turning something on here. Um, just just to be able to highlight some words that are in there and like dia or uh, manana or whatever the word is and it shows up in 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 blue in blue highlight and you can read it and all of a sudden now you're learning a language while you're doing your everyday stuff and so i think that's a very exciting uh, approach to this to learning language like one word at a time in the context of what you're already reading and if you don't know the word you can hover over it and it'll tell you what the word is in English, but it's a cool tool to be able to, to teach language. Are there any books or resources you would recommend to help educators learn more about educating students now and in the future? Oh, that's a that's a great question. I wish you would have gave me a, a, whole, a heads up on that because I, there's a number of books that I've, I've read recently. I Hang on one second. <laughs> Sorry, I'm glad I was wearing pants. The um, this book here that I just finished reading, that has been on. This is one of those things that was a yellow post-it note that's like read this book has been on my list um, for I don't know like a year. So I finally finished this book. David Perkins, Making Learning Whole. is It's is just a fantastic book. And then we'll do one more question. Is there yeah. any last minute advice you would give our Pickerington staff members? Yeah, so so I think that what we need to understand is that this, everything that we're going through is all new. And and I think we need to think about our students, right? I've done I've done a deep dive on this generation, Generation Z, right? Those that are between the ages of, those that were born around the year 2000. So around the year 2000, a couple years before, a couple years after, and who are they? What makes them up? What makes them tick? What are the things that they care about? What are the things they think about? And one of the interesting things about this generation is that until this pandemic, 
I used to call them the 9-11 generation, that they only experience the world after 9-11. They don't know what the world looked like before 9-11. They only know post 9-11. Or I would call them the Great Recession generation because they grew up, they were young um, during the Great Recession, right? Where you got to remember, it took us like five years to get the unemployment rate under 8% back in 2008, 2009, it took us a long time to get to that point. And so they watched their parents struggle. They watched their brothers and sisters go to college and come home and have college debt, not have a job. Like they watched all that. And that's kind of what defined who they are. All that is now blown out the window, right? Like we're talking about a generation of students that are, that are basically the pandemic generation. And everything from being young, like my five-year-old, and understand, like she's gotten to the point where she understands that she can't go somewhere because of a virus, right? And like the word virus is going to be part of, it's going to be ingrained in her world forever, right? So like, what does that mean? And then even our seniors, right? Like this idea that the one thing that we all have in common is that all of us graduated from high school, right? Like that, that's one thing that all Americans have. We, or most Americans have, we graduate. There was this milestone, this ceremony that we graduated from high school and they don't have that. They're not going to get that. And that's huge to me as, as, in terms of something that a student has been looking forward to for a very long time. And like this, this milestone that's in, you know, you start in third grade, you're like, oh my God, the day I graduated from high school is like 300 years from now. But that's been, that date has been in your head for this long, and now you don't get to experience it. So we got to keep that in mind and, and try to look at this from students' perspective and what they're going through and not try to cover the world and not try to, to, to just have empathy for a child that's going through this experience and what we can do to the, for them. Not to say, look how far behind you are on something, but instead find the opportunities to learn and find the opportunities to grow given that world that they face because they, they're going to have a different experience when they're adults because of this experience. And we got to keep that in mind. All right. You passed all the questions, I think. Very good job. All right. So thank you so much for tuning in. And Jamie, thank you so much for coming on to talk to our staff. Yeah. Um, sorry. Just, just yeah. one more thing. Um, yeah. Just, uh, you know, if, Make sure you either follow or reach out to me on Twitter. I'm also on LinkedIn. And I launched a YouTube channel that I talked about earlier uh, that's focused on like career advice for young people. So it's for high school kids. It's for college students. It's for pe young professionals. And I've heard from adults that have been around for a long time. It's it, things like, you know, how to work remotely, how to network on LinkedIn and all these other things that are out there. Basically all the things that I've learned over the past 25 years, I'm trying to create a series of videos to do that. So you should check that out and subscribe if you feel so inclined. All right. Thank you so much. And again, I loved how Jamie really talked about building a community. And if you don't know answers, reaching out to others that might, or they might be able to help you. That was awesome. So on our Padlet, Jamie gave a ton of great resources and ideas, but feel free to add some comments to help some of those other educators that ask those questions so we can grow our learning and toolbox. All right, thank you again, Jamie. Thanks for having me. Okay, we're good. Good?